Hello and welcome to this edition of Wisdom from the Field webinar series produced by the Center for the Ministry of Teaching at Virginia Theological Seminary. This is Forming Faithful Stewards, and I'm thrilled to be joined with our two expert panelists, uh, Carolyn Muma chilton and Diane Wright. Of course, my name is Matthew Kozlowski. Uh, Carolyn, say hello, and Diane, say hello so that we can see your faces. Hi, everyone. Hello, I'm Diane. Nice to see everybody, be with everybody. Well, welcome everybody. Again, we uh, come from the CMT, Center for the Ministry of Teaching, in conjunction with our website, Building Faith, which provides practical resources for a ministry with children, youth, and adults. And then we like to tell you this uh, webinar series, Wisdom from the Field. Today we're talking about stewardship and formation, forming a culture of giving and generosity in our churches and communities. I always like to start with an opening prayer. So whoever you are, wherever you are, however you're joining us today, know that you are in the right time and the right place and give this moment to God as we take a moment and pray. Abundant God, you made us in your image and breathed into us a spirit of generosity that is both gift and response. Move us, we pray, to give as we have received abundantly, generously, and joyfully, that our common ministry may ever bear witness to your unfailing grace. In the name of the three in whom we are one, amen. Amen. And then as is our custom, we begin with a word from scripture to ground us in God's word as we begin our discussion today. This comes to us from First Chronicles. Then David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. David said, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, are the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all this in the heavens and on the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and it is in your hand to make great, to give strength to all. And now, our God, we give thanks to you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to make this free will offering? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, let's get to it. Again, my name is Matthew Kozlowski. I work here at the Center for the Ministry of Teaching, and I'm joined by Carolyn Muma chilton who currently is the Associate for Evangelism and Stewardship at a really phenomenal church in Richmond, Virginia. And over the years, Carolyn has worn just about every hat that you can wear in congregational ministry, as well as uh, small group ministry and camp ministry. And um, I also know that there's some children and grandchildren involved in her life. Um, Carolyn, what else have I missed? Welcome, thank you for being with us. I think you covered it well. Thank you, Matthew, I'm gonna be here this afternoon. Diane Wright currently serves as the coordinator for stewardship for Latino Hispanic congregations in the Episcopal Diocese of Virginia. And she is also an expert in um, formation and has worn many hats, both in the private sector and the public sector. Um, she is uh, attached to two churches in Arlington, Virginia, and um, also some uh, wonderful children in her life. Uh, Diane, what, uh, what have I missed? And welcome. Well, I think that, that covers it. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate. Okay, two more people that I need to thank before we get started. Uh, my two colleagues at the Center for the Ministry of Teaching, Charlotte Hand Greeson, who helped us put this webinar together from top to bottom, and also Sarah Stonecipher, who's our digital missioner and supports the entire series. You can access the slides on this slideshow afterwards and the recording afterwards. And I think you can even access the slides right now if you would like to use that link, that way you can click on the slides. And now I promise I'm gonna get right to it. The first question goes to Carolyn. 
And it is this aspect of stewardship vis-a-vis -vis the annual campaign. And what we've written down is stewardship does not equal the annual campaign. What do we mean by that? What we mean by that is that it's, it, the annual campaign is part of that, but it's not the only piece of that. Um, the title of the webinar is Forming Faithful Stewards. And so stewardship really is about that formation of stewardship and generosity that is year round and not just year round in the congregation, but year round in our lives. And it's also about relationships in that community. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, this is the time of year when a lot of churches uh, of various denominations do have annual campaigns. Uh, in your mind, you know, that, that's okay, right? That's, that's oh, part it's absolutely. It's a huge part of stewardship, but it's not the only part um, of that. It's, it's a piece and should be a piece with the biggest emphasis on formation that's year round and on um, relationship building that's year round in the congregation. So I think we'll keep coming back to that point as we go. I'm glad we started with that. How about this next question, Diane? It's kind of a different frame, isn't it? What do we desire for the people in our churches? Well, I think this essentially um, gets more to the meat of what we're talking about in terms of the formation aspect of it and what Carolyn was referring to in that it is not just about an annual campaign. Um, I think all of us, when we go to church, we are looking to um, connect with God, to under, to feel God's presence in our lives and to um, find that stillness that from which we can then gain strength to go out into the world every day. And so I think that's what we want for the people in our churches. And I think our churches are comprised with just a huge mix of people. Those sometimes you, you would think of like concentric circles, like those that maybe are feel very connected to the church and then those that are maybe just a little less connected. And then finally you come those that come every so often. So how, how do we through all this, through this formation aspect of it, um, each one of us move up a rung, go from whichever level that we're at. And so I think we desire for people in our churches um, to be on that journey and through, through the formation of faithful stewards to help folks um, move up to the next, uh, the next step in, that, uh, in those circles. I, I think that stewardship also not being a, of what we desire for our people and not just the annual campaign is that stewardship is an invitation into um, a different way of life and a different way of seeing our relationships to God and the community and to our own personal relationship with our resources. So it's about that, about inviting people into that invitation and also inviting them into the vision and mission that is unique to your congregation. Um, yeah. It's interesting that you use the word invite, Carolyn, because I was thinking about um, sort of as we try to help folks grow and continue on their faith journey, I recently uh, attended a workshop by uh, Mary Palmer, who does Invite, Welcome, Connect, and how that so closely ties to stewardship. So I think when you're talking stewardship, it, um, it's so many different things. And in the work that I do with parishes, they're like, well, why are, you, why are you curious about what's going on in the children's ministry? Why are you curious about what the Welcome Committee is doing? Well, because it's all, it all interrelates. Um, so that invitation can be at so many different levels as well. I All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep, uh, keep us moving along. Uh, in the beginning of these webinars, we're just gonna talk about big picture topics. And then in the second half, for those of you looking for practical resources, I promise we've got a whole slew of them. So don't, uh, you know, stick with us. And for those of you who have just joined us, uh, you know, welcome, we're glad you're here. Uh, the first part of this webinar is kind of big picture, and then we'll jump into practical resources in the second half. Okay, we've already talked a little bit about relationships, but you know, can we dig down on that a little bit more, Carolyn? Relationships between whom? You know, it's easy for us to say, oh, well, you know, every, everybody should have relationships, but let's say you're a church leadership group thinking about stewardship from a relational lens. Mm -hmm. 
relationships between whom? I think the relationships are between a number of parts, if you will. First is our relationship with God. And I think that is um, nurtured through our relationship with our community, our church. And, and then our relationship with our own resources. So when I think, I had someone told me this once that I think you can probably see my hand. So here's God and here's Carolyn. And, or here's Matthew, and here's Carolyn. And where we find God is in this space in between, in that relationship. And so stewardship is a lot about looking for the connection and what's in between in that relationship. Um, and it's a lot about listening. It's about creating opportunities to know people um, and to know your community and that drives um, engagement and involvement in your community. And engagement and involvement are what drive giving. And so I think that those relationships with God, others, and ourselves um, are very important. With myself, I need to examine what's my relationship with my resources, what's yeah. my relationship with my time, my money, all of that. Yeah, amen. Yeah, no, and as far as the church being a place of engagement, Diane, can I pick on you to tell that story about uh, your daughter, and, and you ended up saying church is not a place where we go. Can you tell that again? Um, so, well, I, I have so many stories about my, or so many stories that relate to my daughter, you might have to make sure I say the right one. No, um, so, um, it is that the fact that so a lot of times when um, it's Sunday morning and maybe I'd want to not necessarily get up and go to church and I would, but I'd be I'd prefer to sit with my cup of coffee sometimes. Um, my daughter would say, come on, mom, let's go. It's always, we always feel better after we've gone to church. Um, and so it's, it's because when we go to church, it is so much more than just going and checking the box. It is where we go and we are in community and we have those relationships and we get those hugs and we come out just feeling so much better about who we are and our place in, in the world and how we can go back out and try to be God's hands and feet in the world. Um, so, and, and I love that. And, I think you distilled it down when we were talking earlier. Church is not a place we go. Church is who we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I just love that. And I think it really speaks to this first point. Um, okay, but now tell us about this cycle of generosity, which I, I think is a great frame. Diane, can you lead us through this? Um, I can. Can I just back up one second though, on the relationships? I yeah. want to just um, tell a little story that happened to me this week, if uh, I can just indulge you for a little bit. Um, I was asked to answer some questions for a, um, an article that our diocesan um, quarterly newsletter is putting together. Um, and it was about relationships. Um, and recently our presiding bishop, so the primate of the Episcopal Church, uh, Bishop Michael Curry, was in Charlottesville. Um, he was there on September 7th, I believe, and he was there essentially in response to um, the hateful acts that occurred in Charlottesville in August and um, was speaking to folks at a church there and was essentially talking about a revolution of relationships. Yeah. And he essentially called for a revolution of relationships, especially with people that might be different than we are. Um, and what he said was, when people actually listen to each other's stories, something changes. Mm -hmm. um, and that also just ties in to what happens in the stewardship venue. And we'll, as we go into the more of some of the more practical aspects, there is listening to each other's stories that is so important. But this call by our presiding bishop to have a revolution of relationships, um, I think is something that will to the extent we can try to live into it, will manifest itself in so many aspects of the church because everything that we do about church, it is all about relationships. 
Um, and so I just wanted to sort of throw that little sort of side story in just because it happened to I me. Just, um, so I, it's something that I'm certainly thinking about. How, how can I personally take that, be a, a revolutionary <laughs> in relationships? Revolution um, of relationships. I love that. So, um, but it does, it does all begin with God, right? So, um, all right. So take us through this cycle. Cause I love this. All right. So, um, I found this in some resources that uh, comes from, um, the diocese of Atlanta. And what I liked so much about it was just how it takes us through a whole circle of stewardship and that it all begins with God. And as the scripture reading that you shared with us stated, all this in heavens and on earth is yours. So step one is acknowledging that God created all and owns it all. And that then that shifts over to God gives us gifts. Um, and we certainly hear about that in scripture. We all have different gifts, but that everything that we have is a gift from God, be it um, the ability to speak multiple languages, be it a mathematical mind, whatever it is that we are accomplishing, um, it is because we've received a, a gift from God. Um, and we often sort of talk about um, sort of, in, 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 we're very independent in the United States, you know, we're self-made man or self-made person and no, we're God made. So this is a reminder that everything that we have comes from God and we are very grateful. So the gifts then we're very grateful for these gifts that we've received from God. Um, we are thankful and we offer thanksgivings. And from that comes generosity. And our scripture reminds us to be generous. We often hear those who give generously are enriched. So it is something that we constantly hear. So then we are generous and then we go to gifts again. But now these are gifts from us back to God, giving of what God, give, God gives us, giving that back. We do that, we give to God, then God gives back to us and enriches us again. And it's a whole cycle. It just keeps going around. It doesn't stop. It just, so we just keep getting enriched. Um, and so sometimes we look at this and then we think, so what might be the sort of the definition of stewardship? Um, and so I look at it as using the gifts that God has given us to do the work God is calling us to do. Um, and that's, that's the framework that we use in the Diocese of Virginia, or at least our um, diocesan offices on stewardship promote that. But it comes all from this circle of generosity. Yeah, I think this is beautiful. And then, Carolyn, I'll let you jump in. There's this sense of, okay, if I'm going to give away things that I have, time or money, then there's going to be less of it. And, uh, you know, in some ways that's true, but what an understanding like this, a circle is, well, actually generosity begets more generosity and gratitude begets more gifts. And there's actually more in, in a, in a sort of um, very holy way rather than less. I would, um, I, lo I love this circle too. Um, one, because it's a circle and it, it keeps going and beginning again and again. And as you said, Matthew, that one of the things that I have found about receiving and giving and generosity is that the gift always turns around and blesses me. Yeah, it really does. Um, and, and I love that surprise. I think in this circle that in every piece or step of the circle, there are all always opportunities to tell our stories and listen to each other. So again, that revolution of relationships and those radical relationships to tell our story and our congregation's story. And in, in the second um, part, in, in the second gift, so it's the green arrow over there on the left, what I, what I notice in, in my work in stewardship is in, in that area, it's when I realized that the individual gifts have come together and created an abundance that none of us could create on our own. Yeah, I, like I can give my individual gifts and, and all of you can, but when it continues around the circle, and gets over there to the left, then, then our gifts are put together and together 
as a congregation, as a church, we can do so much more than any one of us could do alone. And I think that's a very important piece of stewardship and generosity. I'm going to move us along and I'm going to keep track of time. Um, I'm excited about this little opportunity. Here we've got a whole bunch of words that people often use around annual giving and generosity and, and church fundraising. Um, Carolyn, pick two or three of these words. Give us the pros and cons of using them okay. in, uh, in a church setting and, and which ones maybe you like to use as opposed to other ones that you don't like to use. Okay. Um... Well, I'll just look at the first two um, and speak from the context of, of this congregation where I work. Um, we, um, until about three or four years ago, um, used the word stewardship and then did some study and audit of our work. And one of the things that we found out was that um, a majority of people in the congregation didn't understand the word stewardship. Um, and what they heard um, was that we were talking more about um, stewardship of the earth. Um, I think that that um, phrase is more common now in our culture than perhaps stewardship um, in terms of time, talent, and financial giving. And so we actually dropped the word stewardship and picked up the second word, generosity. And so we now have a generosity committee. We have an annual generosity campaign. We have generosity events. And so we talk about generosity as that um, response to what we have received from God and what we can do together. So I love that. Yeah. And so uh, the generosity committee, I love it. <laughs> uh, Diane, same question to you. Which of these words, uh, pros and cons? All right. Um, I'd like to expand a little bit first on Carolyn's um, choice of stewardship. Um, mm -hmm. I do work with Latino Hispanic congregations. And um, I think in, in our vernacular in English, we have difficulty understanding what the term stewardship might mean. The, the Spanish word that is used is mayordomía. And it comes from the root, just like in English, stewardship comes from steward. It comes from the word mayordomo, which means steward, but in the everyday and in the colonial times, it, it was the, the butler, the person that served others, which a steward also in ancient English is, but it just has a, um, a slightly different connotation to me, at least um, in the Latino Hispanic congregations. And so I also talk much more about generosidad, which is the, the generosity. Um, I'm going to pick on, um, I'm going to pick on development just because I do a lot of nonprofit work in my secular world. And um, sometimes how we, we, that people come to a church and think it's a nonprofit. And so what's my contribution going to be? Um, and so how, that's one of those words that works very well in one environment, but how within the church environment, um, again, that's an education of, no, it's not just, you know, I'm making a contribution for tax deduction. Um, I'm doing this for different reasons. It's my spiritual practice, et cetera. Um, the other word I will choose is gratitude, um, because to me, that is the foundation of it all. And um, it is from that, that grateful heart that we give back. Um, I wish I could come up with, and I'll have to maybe think about this a little bit more, but just like Carolyn had the generosity committee, I, I'd love to see some, some variations on the gratitude and maybe some of our participants might have some ideas of things that they've seen out there. Um, All right, and I'm gonna pick on time, talent, and treasure because in our previous conversation, the three of us decided that while it's great that it has TTT, time, talent, and treasure, it's kind of been overused and it might be time to retire time, talent, and treasure and uh, use some of these other wonderful words. We're just throwing it out there. All right. 
Carolyn made a very good point about that in our previous conversation about sometimes people don't really get what treasure means. And right. so maybe being very clear that we mean financial resources yeah. in order right. to do God's work. We are doing it on this, you know, right here and right now, and that takes money. So it's great to give time and talent, but we also need financial resources. Yeah. And sometimes treasure gets a little ambiguous in that regard. Right. And I think if we as the leaders are afraid to use the word money, then we're teaching that um, others should be afraid to use money and that might be a bad word. Um, it's not. Um, it's just another one of the resources that God has given us and asks us to use for the building up of the kingdom. Amen. Okay, for those of you waiting to get something super practical, uh, we're going to show you this from Carolyn's church. Because this, again, just talking about reframing things into a spirit of generosity, gratitude, relationships, community. This is an infographic brochure that um, Carolyn's church put out. And, you know, you've probably seen things like this before. Um, it's not totally reinventing the wheel, but I think it's really beautifully put together. And it just hits home. Um, here's what the church is doing in the world. Here's what the church is doing with the resources, the time, talent, and money that God has provided. And um, it's just a way of getting people excited to kind of kick off sort of some year-round stewardship, year-round generosity. Um, thank you. Anything I, you want to add? Um, I would add it's, you know, it's a way to use some data points, some information that you've got in your church um, about what is going on. It's not just um, money spent, but it's also, you'll see a lot of the numbers are about involvement and engagement. Um, it's um, a way to invite people into your mission um, and your vision of what you want to do um, and just to present it um, in a way um, that's um, easy for people to see. The, the other thing it does is it helps to create some transparency so that people in your congregation can easily see how many people are involved in something or how much money is being spent on a particular program. You would pick your own data points, things that are important to your church, but it helps people see donors. Number one thing a donor wants to know is how you're using their money and are you using it wisely? And so this gives them some information on what the leadership is doing um, with the gifts, time, talent, and money that, that your donors have given. Um, and just a word to folks who are watching, if you've already made something like this, um, that's wonderful. If you haven't and you're thinking, oh my gosh, this would be impossible for us to pull together for the fall, make this a goal for January. You know, make this a goal for the beginning of the new year to have something like this to present digitally or in print to the congregation. Right. That's a great idea. Okay. This is the part where we stop and take questions. We are kind of done with the big picture talking and we want to hear from you so the chat box is open. Our panelists are ready. You can give a question or a comment. Maybe about some of the words that you use in your congregations or words that you don't use in your congregations. This always takes like 30 seconds and then people jump in with the questions and we'll, we'll get them, we'll get the discussion going here. All right, panelists, these folks are just interested in practical resources. I'm going to keep going. Okay. And then listen, folks, as the questions pop up, just chat them in. Okay, Malcolm, here we go. How would you talk about stewardship with youth and children? Resources? Question mark. Yes. Uh, we're coming up with that just in a minute, Malcolm. And then Sarah Bailey said, just wanted to share that we too have moved away from quote unquote stewardship language into quote unquote giving language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we talk about year-round 
generosity, year-round giving, year-round stewardship. Here are some options, just ideas. Carolyn, can you mention one or two of these and uh, expound a little bit? I can. Um... One of the things that we have found that's very important is electronic giving, whether that um, might be, I think an important piece um, is that people can pledge and give from your website um, if you are able to set that up. But certainly I think all of us, um, whatever size church we're in, can encourage people to give electronic, electronically through their bank. So that's something they set up with their bank, just like a, an ePay or you may pay your bills through your bank, um, is to encourage people to set the church up as a regular weekly or monthly payment um, through their bank. Electronic giving, the, the church here where I am, you can um, give from the website, you can also pledge from the website. Um, we've gone um, a few steps further. We have an app that you can put on your mobile device uh, and give from that. And we also have a kiosk in the parish hall. Uh, we named her so she wasn't so scary. Her name is Gracie. Um, and people love Gracie because they can pay their pledge with a swipe of their credit or debit card. They can pay for Sunday breakfast. They can register for events. They can update their address. and. Um, She's a popular little kiosk standing down there. Um, so I think that helps year-round stewardship. Um, the other piece um, that I talk about is the thank you process. Um, and that is, you probably can't say thank you enough to the people who are supporting you in all the various ways that they support you. Um, two or three times a year, we send out a thank you card to people, um, and that's um, sometimes something that we have designed here and we print it on the copier and mail it out to people. Every now and then we have it done out of house. We send um, thank you emails. I put flowers on the altar periodically in Thanksgiving for, um, for donors. So there are lots of ways that you can say thank you. I, I try to work through our donor list and call people, so many people a week. So I think you can't thank people enough. And if in your congregation, you don't have a staff person, like I'm, so I'm the staff person, but many congregations don't have a me. Um, and, but the volunteers, you can do this. You can call uh, one person a week or make it your aim to speak to a different person every Sunday and just thank them for all that they do. Makes a huge difference, works on those relationships. Um, thank you, Carolyn. Diane, I'm gonna turn it over to you first with a question um, from Jerry, and then we can get into some of these. So Jerry says, recently I read a book, Kitchen Table Giving by Bill Enright. And he made me realize that most generosity decisions are made around people's kitchen tables. Let me repeat that. Most generosity decisions are made around kitchen tables. How do we enter their conversations there? What kind of resources would work well? Well, that's an excellent question. And that is, I know in, in my family scenario, it is at the dinner table where we have these conversations. Um, a lot of this, in my view, has to do with the sort of the process of education that we go through sort of on that year round basis um, and where it is. And, and by education, I mean formation. I don't mean um, necessarily um, sort of like the typical Christian education model, but how do we help people sort of get into that circle of generosity and giving? And um, there, are, there are a couple of points to that. One is, as families, we learned about generosity from our families and from our friends. And then we also learned about it and saw examples in scripture. So how do we as families model generosity and everything that we do so that the conversation isn't this, just this one-time conversation? It is something that we're constantly talking about and constantly doing. Um, and 
how do we then engage everybody? Because it is formation for everybody. It's not just the parents deciding. It's engaging everybody in the conversation of this is what we do as a family. And we do it for the annual giving campaign. But then as we will we'll talk, this is sort of in the area of the year round, but we also do participate in the, you know, stewardship of the Earth Day. And we participate in community service in our, that goes through our church. Um, so I think that that, it just becomes, it's not just a one-time conversation, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, in terms I, of resources, I think that's, the probable, the, I think there would be some of the scripture readings and some things that um, we- Let me jump in. There's an article on building faith that we did. Uh, uh, 20 questions to get families talking about money. Mm -hmm. um, and you can find that on building faith. Okay, let me go through a few more of these and then um, I'm gonna do a question from Stuart. So we're just kind of getting this going. Um, testimonials, um, Carolyn, give me uh, kind of pros and cons of uh, the classic stewardship testimonials. Uh, yeah, we, um, I think that you don't wanna overdo that because um, you don't want to get into a situation where people say, oh, I never go to church in October because they always have someone up there asking me for money. Um, we use um, testimonials, um, oral testimonials in church one or two Sundays during the, the actual campaign season. The other Sundays we use written testimonials. Um, in the bulletin, we generally, uh, people that we ask to write them, we give them the same question, we print the question, and then we give different answers to them. Um, and one of the questions we ask is, why is the giving uh, important to you? And um, so we want their personal story again. So I think testimonials are great, but you don't want to overdo the oral part, in my opinion. That's great. Um, just a couple of things to point out year-round giving calendars. There are a lot of options and uh, uh, resources there online. We've got a few of them later. And narrative budget. I don't think we're going to have time to talk about that today, but um, it's it's a concept that's very important. I know a lot of folks uh, listening have probably used it, and you can find out more. Um, find a church that has a narrative budget. Ask around. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me, let me go to the next slide just so that people can kind of read as they go while I answer a question from Stuart Mills. We are focused on stewardship as a spiritual practice rather than fundraising. Stuart says, don't focus so much on the needs of the church, rather focus on your own spiritual need to give. But there is a constant pressure from the vestry to insist on saying just what the church needs. Any thoughts? Well, first of all, we're all nodding our heads. So thank you, Stuart, for saying that. I have one thought, and then Diane, do you want to jump in on that? The verse that I think is so important is when Jesus says, um, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your money is, there your heart will be also. And I know we use that verse a lot, but it, it speaks. Um, I always like to say that money is important to God or God cares about money, not because money is important to God, but God cares about money because money is important to us. And Jesus talks a lot about money in the new Testament because he knows how much a place it has in our lives. And that is a spiritual point. So Stuart, to, to remind your vestry of that, which I'm sure you've done already. And then Diane, what else do, would you like to say about that? Well, it just uh, struck me sort of on a similar vein of how do we go both as individuals, as churches, as dioceses from looking at things through a mindset of scarcity to one of abundance. And um, I think sometimes vestries are charged with a financial picture of the church, but just in the same way we are charged with the finances of our personal homes. And we are on our journey trying to live in that abundance and um, sort of living that out. So I feel that it's, we need to see how do our churches operate with this. I've, I'm affiliated with a church where 25% of every dollar that comes in goes back out to the community. I know of other churches that goes up to 50%. So to be honest, there are people that give generously to our church because they know it's going back out, its percentage is going back out into the community. 
And to what extent at a diocesan level, if the diocese has a project, do they then tithe as part of that? And so how do vestries sort of take, live into the truth that we are doing as having that uh, viewpoint of we have everything that we need because we get it all from God? I would, um, I would encourage you as much as possible not to get into um, a model of we need X amount of dollars and we need you, the congregation, to give us that X amount of dollars. Instead, I would say, this is our vision and this is our mission. This is what we want to do in 2018. We need your support to do that and not get into um, a dollar amount for this or a dollar amount for that um, because you can encourage giving just to those specific things or you would, you might be limiting somebody's giving by saying we need $50,000 for um, these 10 programs or we need $3,000 for the children's program. I would instead talk in terms of vision and mission and invite them into that and let them help create what that response can be. Amen. Let's take a look at some of these things that you can do right now. Um, if year round stewardship is still something that we are talking about, but aren't able to implement, these are things that could happen this month, next month into the fall. And, um, Diane, the, the share stories of generosity, have you seen that working in, in some of your congregations? So um, there are the, the testimonials that happen at church. Um, there are also gatherings that um, one of the churches that I'm affiliated with has been having where different parish leaders come and it's a small gathering of maybe, you know, 10, 15 people um, where it's more casual sharing of stories and in a little bit more of an intimate setting. Um, but I think just as I, I mentioned at the beginning when talking about uh, the revolution of relationships, we do need to hear each other's stories. And I think we do need to hear how people do feel that their lives have been transformed by their membership in this church and by the relationships that they have in this church. So, so let me get that right, Diane, because I think that's really important. So you have a smaller group of folks who are pretty involved and it's maybe 10 to 15 folks and they meet as part of a small group. So they, it's maybe like five leaders that are, that host the event. Yeah, yeah. And it's open to the whole parish, but they have like four or five different ones at different times, you know, evening, day. So the group itself that gathers isn't that large, okay. um, but it is about those folks sharing their stories. And it's a, the agenda is to share stories of faith or share s stories of generosity specifically? Um, well, I, yeah, I would say that they're intertwined. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think the ultimate goal is to build more faithful stewards. That is the goal of, of these small gatherings. All right. I'm going to move us on. And then we're going to talk about tithing because uh, Ben Badgett brought that up in one of the questions. This is a, a great little set of slides I'll do the first slide and the second slide. Um, stewardship Bible study texts. A lot of these you know already, but it's good to have them all listed in one place. Can I just right. say something about, um, I, I think the, um, the flow of these is really wonderful because it takes us from the goodness of creation into the importance of community and vocation and um, that God is trustworthy and we give back. And particularly in some of the parables, um, I recently read an article about these. And, you know, Jesus talks about money a lot, maybe, uh, maybe more than anything else. And when we come upon those passages, the, the author of the article was saying not to look at it so much as how much money is God saying I should give or how much money does Jesus want me to give or the church want me to give, but to look at it um, is that the point of the story is not how much money, but how is my relationship to my, to my money or my time uh, impacting my relationships. And so how can I write my relationships with God and my community and, and my resources 
um, and not think of it only as a certain amount of money, but that Jesus, maybe he's talking to us about the relationship and not, um, oh my goodness, God wants all my money, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, amen. Let me read this question from Ben Badgett, word for word. The concept word tithe, i.e. 10%, can be exciting producing concept, especially when viewed as a biblical mandate. How do we speak to the concept of a tithe when the reality is that 10% is not a normative practice for many people? I, I responded there that um, we talk about the tithe more as a goal. Um, I think um, in the Episcopal Church, I, I don't have any statistics. I don't know that if tithers are um, a majority of people or not. I think it's a very difficult word to, um, to understand. And so we talk about the tithe as, as a goal to move towards and then move beyond. And we have found some success and, and better understanding with the tithe. We use what's called the step method. I think there's a book, I, a number of years ago, I have some book about the step method or something, but I'm gonna hold up a chart we use. Yeah. Oh, and, um, I can send it to you if you want, but it just shows you um, how many people give at what level and, and then the, the chart of how much you give um, per week. And so you, it's very easy to see, okay, I'm giving $5 a week. If I wanted to move up into another level, I could give $6 a week. And what that might mean in terms of the percent of my income that I'm giving. So breaking it down like that may help people um, and help you um, teach about the tithe. I like that. And I would add that we, just like we are in our personal faith journeys, we're not right there at when we get at the, from the get-go. We're constantly building up step by step. So the idea is to get everybody started and then incremental, you know, just the next year, the next, a little bit more, the next year, a little bit more, just like maybe you start going to church, you know, checking it out, and then you start going once a month, and then you start going every Sunday. So you just baby, you got to take the baby steps. Right. Um, we've got up on the screen right now just a prayer, which you all can use with attribution. Um, it's just really lovely about relationships. My church is who I am, and I am who the church is. This would be a great resource to do in the, this period now where we're in the, what can you do now? Maybe put that in your bulletin or, you know, pass it along to, to members of your congregation for them to realize, oh yeah, I ma I have to take a step. It's what I do that impacts what happens in this church. Yeah. And then Malcolm uh, mentioned resources for children and youth. I think you could do uh, a, an older children's uh, Sunday school class with this prayer. Or, or a youth group session by breaking down this prayer. Um, teenagers in particular are very fascinated by how they can give and make a difference or whether they're not giving and not making a difference. This is some fodder there. We are gonna keep going through some of these resources that we have for you. Um, the children's pledge cards uh, or children's pledge envelopes. I shouldn't say that uh, pledge. Children don't really make pledges, um, sort of. Don't we have a bunch that do. We have. They, do they do the pledges? Yep. Yes. And they call it a pledge? Yeah. I yeah. love it. So what yeah. do they say? Um, I'm going to give you $2 a month or something like that. Um, and then they have little envelopes like this great one that um, Diane um, found and yeah, they 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 fill out a pledge card or their or their parents fill out a pledge card and they're they get the thank you notes and everything. Just I send them special thank you notes. A card. I don't send them a letter. I send them a, a card. But yeah, no. That is so cool. Well, <laughs> I like this concept of um, on this. It's my good deed was um, and. I, in 2020 hindsight, I was an, or am an electronic giver, and in my parish, when the basket comes around, I don't have anything to put in because I've done it electronically. So I now feel this terrible guilt that I was, did not model for my children what I'm now preaching. So how can we make sure that we, as adults, are modeling for the kids and that the church gives us an opportunity to do that? And maybe it needs to go the other way where we learn from this little exercise and we put something that 
we're thankful for an action that we've done or a deed or that we feel that we're going to do something else so that it's not just the finances. It is the time, the talent as well. Okay. And this is just another example. And then they've got them stuck up on a bulletin board here. And what's neat about these, uh, Charlotte sent this to me, is that they're, you're matching gratitude with generosity. So thank you. And then here's my offering. Okay, this is a great document and um, you know, you'd be able to view or download this from Building Faith or from the slideshow presentation. It's got ideas for every month, things that you can do in January, February, it all through uh, and things that many things that your church might already be doing, but to look at them through the lens of gratitude and generosity. And it includes both sort of the reminders of when to thank or different ways of thanking that Carolyn has been mentioning, as well as different ways of giving. So not just in the annual campaign, but if you're, you know, it's springtime in the church and you're, everybody's doing their own spring cleaning. Well, maybe how can those, you know, all the clothing be donated and I don't know, just different ways of continuing to, to give both internally and externally. The resources um, from Stewardship University, um, I think it's referenced there. This is the um, Reverend Timothy Dombeck. He was on the bishop's staff in the Episcopal Diocese of Arizona. And um, he's now um, in a parish, but the resources are still there. And um, they're top quality. Um, a lot of his PowerPoint slide presentations um, and these kind of resources are there. And so I encourage you to take a look at some. Some of them are also on the website, I think for the Diocese of Southern Virginia, but I, I can find them for you. They're great stuff. Here's just a couple of other links for you to check out. Um, and then Stewardship University is mentioned at the bottom. And again, these slides are gonna be available through Building Faith uh, tomorrow. I'm just going to make a quick little um, comment about this money personality types quiz, um, only because I think as somebody was referring vestries, I mean, every individual in either a vestry, a stewardship committee, or finance committee might approach money from a different perspective. Um, and so sometimes we're not talking the same language. And th this resource I thought was interesting to just make us realize oh, I'm generally a hoarder. I just really don't like to part with my money, period. Versus someone else is like, oh, I don't even balance my checkbook. I have no idea where my money goes. But when those two people are speaking to each other, they may just be talking past each other. So it's a fun little way of getting folks on the same page. That's a great idea to have a, a, a vestry or leadership council do the money harmony quiz. Maybe before people get married. No. <laughs> Uh, yeah, definitely before people get married. That's great. All right. Uh, we've got people have been asking questions as we go along, but now we've got another chance. Okay, Carolyn and Diane, any last burning thoughts, uh, things that you wanted to add that we forgot to get to, or a final inspiration that you would say, if there's one thing that you could tell your congregation about money and generosity and giving, it would be blank. Um, the floor is yours for final thought. Um, I'm going to sort of just give one sort of practical aspect within, in the sort of things to think about now um, are how do we do collect the offerings? Um, and I think in some parishes, it's just done in the plate, the, the annual giving, and in others, it is done as a separate special moment in a worship where people bring it up to the altar. So that I think is something that um, folks can consider as they're looking at whether there's something that they could do now. Um, to change things up a little bit. I would just add that um, the generosity campaign and your annual campaign, any campaigns you might do throughout the year, 
um, is to see them as an opportunity of inviting people into the work of your of your church and the building of the kingdom of God and uh, not as drudgery. <laughs> it, um, if we, the leaders, have fun with it, um, that's formation. Um, people learn by watching us. And the final question I just wanted to address again also about uh, children and youth. Um, they learn, the main way they learn how to be a Christian is through their families. And so I think that I, I would put my focus on parenting classes and working with parents. Um, and, and that will trickle down and, and up to the children and, and the youth. That's also kitchen table giving. It's been fun to be here. Thank you all um, for joining us. And Carolyn, you mentioned an app. What app does your church use for giving? Um, the app we use is tied to our database. It's okay. Shelby Next Giving. So it's, it. it's tied into our database. Got it. It's not a separate app. Um, friends, I'm going to say this closing prayer. And then after I say the closing prayer, I just sign off. So um, Diane, if you can say uh, a farewell and Carolyn the same, and then I'll read the prayer and we'll finish up. Um, well, it has been wonderful to participate in this. And I think sort of my parting word is that um, God is love and love transforms. And can you put a price tag on that? Amen. Yep. Thanks again. I've enjoyed being with you all. And uh, to pick up on what Diane said uh, in Henry Nouwen's word is aim for the love. Thanks. Let us pray. To be grateful is to recognize the love of God in everything he has given us. And he has given us everything. Every breath we draw is a gift of his love. Every moment of existence is a grace for it brings with it immense graces from him. Gratitude therefore takes nothing for granted is never unresponsive, is constantly awakening to new wonder and to praise of the goodness of God. For the grateful person knows that God is good, not by hearsay, but by experience. And that is what makes all the difference. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us in this Wisdom from the Field webinar. It's been our pleasure talking stewardship with Carolyn Chilton and Diane Wright. I'm Matthew Kozlowski. Thanks again. <laughs>